launching America's Entrepreneur. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Aaron Spatz, and each week we interview entrepreneurs, industry experts, and other high achievers as they detail their personal and professional journeys. Before we jump in, hit the subscribe button and be sure to hit the bell icon so you're notified every time we release a new episode. Hey, thank you so much for joining America's Entrepreneur. So excited again to bring just some some amazing content and some amazing people to help encourage you in your entrepreneurial journey. Whether you're starting your own business or you've started your own business and looking to kind of understand what have other people done, what have been some of the challenges, what have been some of the, some of the wins, some of the big things that they've learned that maybe you could take to your own journey and and, and overlay that on onto your onto the journey of business, right? So excited to welcome back a friend of the show, Ian Sefton. So for those that may not know Ian, Ian was earlier on the show, and I believe Ian, you were on when I when the show was titled the Veterans Business Podcast. So those that are new new to America's Entrepreneur, I collapsed two productions I was doing. I was doing the Veterans Business Podcast. I was also doing the DFW Business Podcast for those that are in the Dallas Fort Worth area. I smashed them together and I retitled everything to call it America's Entrepreneur. So Ian was on episode 41. Absolutely tremendous. You'll hear his life story. You'll hear the work that he was doing with Hangar 202. And then it was the early days of Funnel 9. And now uh, Ian has been operating Funnel 9 now for for a little bit of time. And so we're going to check in with him, see how that's going and, and all sorts of other things that he's up to. So Ian, I just want to welcome you, man. Thank you so much for joining me yet again. Yeah, it's good to be back. Absolutely. So catch us up. For those that may not know you, just just real briefly, kind of give everybody just a quick little two, three minute, just little little story about you know how you how you started in business and then how you've gotten to funnel nine. Maybe maybe even it's maybe even better to say like what need did you address or or did you see that you wanted to address a funnel nine? Maybe that's a better starting point. Yeah, fair enough. So um, I think uh, just to rewind a little bit, um, the reason I think we were on the first time is I was a veteran entrepreneur and I'm still a veteran uh, and I'm still an <laughs> entrepreneur. Good. So not, yeah. <laughs> not much has changed other than uh, I'm attacking a totally different market that I had no experience in, um, attacking it with what I thought was the perceived need, um, which was better data for uh, digital spend. And I even had some of my own business investments that I was able to build it on. So I had a live patient. We were able to kind of incorporate all the things that they were doing with digital spend and try and figuring out new ways and innovative ways to measure and and see how that performance is. And so that's kind of how Funnel9 started, you know, investments that I had made within Hangar 202 and personally um, built this product initially for ourselves, then realized, wow, this is pretty cool, showed it to some friends. They were like, yeah, we want this. So kind of rolled it out that way. And that's kind of where we are today, except we're about to do a major pivot. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll get the pivot here in a second. You're, you're touching on a important topic and it can be a four letter word in the world of business, but, but marketing, understanding marketing spend, understanding, you know, where are all these dollars that I magically had and now they've magically disappeared very, very quickly. And how do I account for all that? And so like for you that, I mean, you saw that as a need, but now you got me intrigued because the word pivot that does, that does come up, it comes up in business. I've, I've had to pivot my own business before. And I know tons of people that are watching and listening to this have had to do the same. So help us understand then what situation did you come across that led you to believe that making a pivot is the right move? Yeah. So initially we, we, like I said, we built it to fill our own need. And yeah. I think that's probably mistake number one is assuming that every customer is yourself, right? Like you hear a lot of people saying, if you have a problem and you can fix it, maybe there's a market for it. Maybe there is. Um, what we found initially was that there was a market, but it was a very niche market. And if they, for example, the B2B uh, market, which is the one we are attacking, these are high value leads. So every dollar you spend, you want to know where it's going because, you know, you're obviously looking for an ROI. And so there's a qualification process that would take place, a manual process that would take place where this comes in. Yes, it was a lead and this is the value and giving it a value and and qualifying. It took 30 seconds. And so for businesses that were getting maybe 20, 30, 40 a day, no problem. They love our product. But for bigger businesses that were getting 100 a day, they couldn't keep up. And so we saw compliance drop and you started to go, oh, wow, this is a problem. 
And so they started asking us to automate, automate this, automate that. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we were getting just a ton of e-commerce businesses, the Shopify's, the, you know, the, the kind of single widget to multi-widget, you know, startups that you see on Instagram as you're scrolling, uh, selling everything from yoga pants to, you know, new water bottles to whatever. And they were just hitting us and we didn't have one word about e-commerce on our website, not one. Wow. And we're like, man, we're, are we missing something here? Because it's obvious there's a need there because they're pounding the door down. We're not doing any outsourced marketing. It's all just organic. And there's something here. So over the holidays, we decided let's build a MVP of the attribution engine that would now be e-commerce. We built it. We have two customers on it and the data, the insights, really the insights. It's not about data. It's about insights. It's like blowing them away. We're finding channels where they were spending, you know, thousands of dollars for zero orders and other channels that they're spending maybe a thousand dollars a day or $500 a day that are bringing in 80% of their volume. Okay. but they're capping it because of their daily spend. So just things that they weren't noticing because they're trying to be everywhere to everyone. So it's kind of like, I, I, I like to tell people funnel line is a single source of truth for insights on where the marketing is working, where it's not. That's it. That's amazing. That, and it's such an amazing tool because again, I mean, it's, it, it can be so nuanced and I'd love your feedback to this question because this is something I think that comes up a lot in marketing is like, okay, well, You've got to spend money. You got to spend money on, you know, you, get, you have to spend ad spend to collect data points, like to be able to have something to reference. So how do you, how do you address that problem? Yeah, I, I can give you a good example that I think most, anybody that's paying for ads on Google will understand. So a lot of times there's some great PPC consultants out there too. And boy, they, they there's a mix of uh, magic and, and art and the science, right? I mean, yeah, they'll show you Excel and you, you make data-driven decisions. We've all heard that. But there's so much nuance, like you said. There's so many things that are kind of, you know, abstracted from your view because it's, I don't want to say it benefits Google, but it definitely benefits Google uh, yeah. for you to continue to spend, right? So, um, you know, I always like to follow, like, where, what are we, what behaviors are we, rewarding and what we reward is people that have high spend and don't watch it and google will find a way to spend every dollar but when you look at google like you know you have campaign level then you have keyword level then you have device type then you have geo and then you have time so you have all these different knobs and so i liken it to like flying a 767 as you're flying a 767 there's a lot of micro adjustments that you can do to make the flight for the passengers way better right and it's the same thing in spend it's like you know if you're selling office furniture um, online and most of your businesses in California, should you be really advertising in Florida? Are you going to be able to compete with a local person with, when you factor in shipping? Probably not. So just, you know, kind of tightening the circle. Um, you know, are people looking for office furniture, like large offices, like conference room and everything? Are they looking for that stuff uh, on their phone? Maybe, but probably the buying decision will take place on a desktop where they can see larger images, where they can zoom in and, 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 and you know, so just taking these and, and that's the way we provide the data is to provide, to provide you that insight. So you, we track for 90 days for free. No one pays a thing. It's like, there's no risk. Sign up for us. You get it for 90 days. And what we do is before we even show it to you, we don't even show you the data. We say, Aaron, tell me what's working for you. And you go, uh, uh, and then you say, uh, I think Facebook and I've got some Instagram stuff that's working pretty well. And I do pretty well on Google. And then we go, okay. And we take notes and we go, all right, well, here's your real data. And, and when we present it, I mean, not feigning, but they should faint when they see how much sometimes yeah. they're spending that they shouldn't right. be but gasping is definitely something that happens. Like, you know, this like, wow, we spent $12,000 on that one ad on, on YouTube and it's zero orders. You know, and I get it. There's some impression we're building a brand. And I think that's true for some places. But let's be real. There's so much noise out there. There's so many different brands. Sometimes you have to be conversion focused at least 60 to 70 percent of the time, especially if you're an e-com player, because let's be real, like Nike and Adidas are always going to be the big brands like you can disrupt a little bit, but we're not going to know john's you know jock short you know that's perfect for squatting in like we're just not going to know it we're not going to remember it you got to keep me over and over and over with it so if you focus on where those things are actually converting eventually there's enough of a data model that you can be like let's put more money towards that yeah. so kind of Pareto principle like let's just use a lever and find the ones that are really working for us yeah well in in what you're doing is you're just, you're just doubling down on this the success you're helping people understand so for those that are very metric centric 
that rhymed. That was great. Uh, but that that really want to understand, like, help me get the most mileage out of this dollar as humanly possible. Like that is absolutely going to help them understand like this is working. This isn't. And then you kind of hit it on it a minute ago is then there is, of course, there is just the general brand awareness aspect of that, too, where, yeah, I mean, if you want to spend 10 grand in a day on Google, Facebook, wherever, you could spend that really freaking fast and have very little to show for it. And I think that's your point, right? Is like you're the point you're making is like, yeah, there's there you can, if you elect to have a brand awareness element where you just understand you're spending money just to get eyeballs on it. Yes. But if you, but if you really care more so about the insights and understanding, okay, like, is this demographic working? Is this geo working? Is this yes. format working? Then this is where funnel nine really can help you to like dial that in like really tight. Totally. So, so yeah. like, uh, this will be something from your military days that you'll understand. So, you know, it's kind of like going from a frag grenade to like a sniper rifle. Like we're going to yeah. tell you exactly where to, to take the kill shot. It's not going to be just throw it into Instagram and hope for the best. It's going to be like, you know what? Instagram's converting, but only in the morning. You're only getting orders in the morning. So like maybe you should dial it down a little bit. Like, you know, maybe you don't need to be there all day. Maybe you pump all your spend in the very beginning of the day and see what happens. And so, like I said, it's a lot of micro adjustments. We're not trying to help you change your strategy. We're just trying to measure what's working, what's not. Yeah. Well, then how does it work with the evolution of a trend, right? Like the, what works today isn't necessarily going to work next next month, next quarter. So how does that help? I mean, oh, that's, I know, that, I mean that's, oh, that's a softball of a question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but it's a great one because I think that's what a lot of people get wrong about digital marketing in general is so they, they think they got it dialed in because like sales are coming in. I'm spending as a percentage of sales. Let's just say 3% of my top line is going to marketing and I'm just like living the dream. And that could work. And if your goal is maybe a lifestyle business, which is totally fine, that, that could be to totally sustainable for sure. But if you're like most of us, which you're kind of just competitive, you want to grow. If you're not growing, you're shrinking, they say. Like you may want to look for these little, little levers that you can pull on. And, and so one example of that, we collect all the data first party, right? So this is your data. You're collecting it. You're not relying on Google. You're not relying on Facebook or Apple. So when they make a change, they're a big platform. They're allowed to do that. It doesn't impact you because you've been collecting this data all the time. And so the longer you collect the data, the, I think the story gets even more compelling. So yes, maybe a new social platform comes in, a new channel comes in, a new technique, a new way of going viral, whatever that is. Yeah. You'll be able to jump on those faster, I think, because you'll have all of the uh, demo data, all the things of where your customers are actually at. And then you just amplify that new technique on those channels. Because I think it's like the old school television. You know, some people watch channel two for news. Some people watch channel 11, right? Fox CN people have their belief systems and they they like those certain channels. Yeah. We'll tell you which channels your customers, your actual people that are paying with their dollars because people vote with their dollars. They may vote with their, uh, they may sort of vote with their likes and their impressions, but they actually vote with their dollars. We'll sure. show you what channels are they're playing in and what they're engaging with. So maybe in some cases, video content's working. Maybe it's not, you, it's, it's so dependent on the business, but that's that's an example of why it's important to put this in and measure it over a longer period of time because you just get more and more granular as you go. Yeah, you're collecting more data points. You're able to kind of start to see trends in it. That's really cool what you're saying about it being first party data. So you're not you're not relying on, you know, what they what they tell you. And I mean, we're assuming it's all true, but you don't have to, you don't have to depend on that. You have your own ledger that you're keeping you're keeping track of. <laughs> we've seen we've seen Google report conversion data, which is sales data, 30 to 45% higher than what was really happening. No way. We also feed those, those algorithms, both Google, Facebook, anybody that's basically using data to kind of figure out where your, where your marketing is working for you. Cause I'm not saying that the big tech monopolies uh, don't want you to win. Of course they need you to make money so they can make money. Right. right. So there is a shared interest there. Um, so we feed data back to them too. So, cause we're giving, we're getting first party. So we're just going right back and we're saying like, no, we had 27 hits from this one ad and this channel, take it and, and do your computation and figure out what, how to service more people like that. Wow. That's pretty awesome. That's well, it's great to see that that's, that that's picking up for you, but you are, instead of being open to all companies, all business types. Now you're, you're, 
back to your pivot, you're, you're pivoting more into e-commerce. That's going to be more of like your exclusive focus. Yeah, we're good. Well, so the B2B is totally built out and we have uh, so many customers that we're, we're going to continue to support that. And we'll, we'll iterate on it as we need, as demand comes from the, uh, from the customers. So feedback on what they want features and everything else. Um, but we think what we've unlocked is probably the cocky stick of the company, which is where the kind of the, the major growth will take place, which is e-com. Now we haven't marketed, we haven't updated our website. Like you're probably the first person I've talked to about this other than our beta customers. So we have a couple beta customers that we've been building it on. Um, but yeah, we're, we're about to, we're probably 30 days from a, from a big marketing push, uh, website refresh and, and really get out there and, and hold on. I mean, when you, when you see accelerated growth, uh, it, it can be quite a bit to handle. So we're, we're going to have to get ready hiring and all those things. Yeah. That's true. So that, so that, so why don't we just go ahead and segue into that, into, into that topic. So you've, Ian, like you've had an opportunity to kind of have a front row seat to a lot of different types of investments, a lot of different companies. You have invested a lot of money into the various companies yourself. And so how have you advised other people? And, and like, this would be a great question just because you have a really unique perspective is there's a lot of folks out there that they are either in the capital raise mode or they're in the, they are in the bootstrap mode. And there's, and there's a lot of data or, or like a lot of opinion rather about which, you know, which route you need to go, depending on what kind of company you are just in your experience, like where, what, what have you seen have been like success, you know, critical success factors, right. Of, of companies being able to grow, like being able to support like a high growth, which is typically with capital infusion it doesn't sound like that's the case for you. It sounds like it's just, it's been a lot of organic growth and that's going to ramp up very quickly. How do you, how do you prepare for that? Like, how do you harness that energy? Well, to be fair, um, we, I've had a few exits prior to funnel nine. And so that's allowed myself and my business partner to self fund a lot of the early stage. Um, we're probably going to need to raise capital at some point. We're just trying to wait as far as we can with what we want to really make sure we have something. Um, you know, there's there's things that obviously VC angel investors look for these metrics that if you can really hit them or outperform certain ones that they find a lot of value in, uh, you know, who knows what valuation you can get on that raise. Right. And so it's all about playing the trying not to get too diluted, trying not to become a minority owner in your own business. Yeah, right. um, so I'm not, I'm not opposed to raising uh, money at all. Um, we raised money for Synchromatics before we sold it. Um, you know, we raised money for uh, Cure Pharmaceutical. Um, we're, we're just being a little bit more prudent. And the cool thing about this is because we've had some early success, we're not in a hurry. So that's the, that's the other thing is like, you're at different age and stage. I've, I've got, you know, five kids, I'm coaching them in sports. I'm doing things right now that I'm really enjoying. And so yeah. once you take dollar one from a VC, their thumb is on your back and they're really pushing you to try and make this thing a rocket ship. And so while we plan to do that, we didn't want that early when we were kind of feeling ourselves our, our way around in the dark. Um, as far as investing though, I mean, I've done probably more angel investments. Well, I really was heavy in 2016, but I, I accelerated in 2018, 2019, 2020. And even during the pandemic, I was still doubling and tripling down on some of the, the earlier investments that are doing really well. Um, I'm also investing in things that like are a little bit of a stretch for me. I think um, this NFT thing, which, you know, there's people that argue on both sides of it, but I've just deployed some capital towards an NFT fund that I'm pretty excited about. I do think there is applications outside of just having a cool thing on Twitter. Um, you know, as your, as your main image. Um, and that technology is really interesting. And so the cool thing about interesting tech is if you invest in it early and it really turns out to be something you, you can have outsized return. So, um, but that's it. I mean, as far as raising capital, I don't know if there's a best time. I do know that what I look for when I'm reading plans is the team. Like I love when, a when, a two employees from a, from a previous company that kind of had that accelerated growth decide they want to do their own. I love that because they've yeah. got, they know the pressure and the stress that that brings on an organization and they've stepped on a few of those landmines and they know what to watch out for. So, you know, teams with a history together really, I really resonates with me. And then also just trying to find something that's not so me too. You know, if everybody's going one way, maybe they maybe zag a little bit, but 
you know, to be perfectly blunt, I, I, I bet on a lot of things. Some went to zero, some have done really well and IPO would and, um, you know, I'm still here. I mean, that's, that's the game of investing, I think. Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, so what I hear you saying then is with funnel nine specifically, you're just, you're in, you're in a totally different phase. You're in a different phase of life. You're in a different phase just in general. And so you, this, this would have looked different had this been company one or company two, like 100%. you're, you're several steps down the road. So for you, this is a, you know, you have, you have other things that you're concerned with and you, you have the capital to be able to deploy and to take your time and to do it the way that you'd like to do it without that VC pressure that, that you like you've seen with tons of other companies, you know, that, that are just getting going. So that's yeah. uh that's definitely, definitely unique. Yeah. And that's, if you were going to start, if you were going to, if this was company one for me, I mean, I think that there's some pretty well-known tracks to go, you know, the YC route, which I mean, their track record speaks for themselves. I mean, I, I feel like it's gotten so big now that maybe it's not as good as it was five, 10 years ago. I don't know that for a fact, but it just seems like anything that grows to a certain size loses some kind of intrinsic value that, you know, you can't really put your finger on it, but like, man, it was really magical when it was like, you know, five people in a hundred companies. Um, they are putting more dollars to work. I think they're doing like half a million now, which is astronomical for an angel investment. You know, my angel investments are five to 30,000 generally. I mean, I don't put, especially on a business plan and a team that's, so that's really cool. Um, and then you got like people like Jason Calacanis who do some stuff with launch, which I've, I've got a couple investments with him as an LP and, and they do a lot of the cool thing about getting into an accelerator or that type of thing. And I don't mean all of them because some of them are just shysters, but like the more established ones that have like educational tracks, like engineering support, product talks, like you go to the YC website, you can get a college level education on how to start a business. You don't need to go to business school. Just watch all the YC videos, read every article Paul Graham wrote, and you'll be light years ahead of somebody that went to Harvard or Yale and went the traditional business track for sure. Wow. Well, that's uh, that that's some pretty that's some pretty pointed advice. And I think for those that are that are listening and taking notes on on terms of what to do, like what they should do next, I think that's a that's a really good place to start. So, if if I'm a company and I have this hairy idea to change the world, what then for you as an investor most gets your attention? I heard you say a minute ago that you like to see not just following the crowd and where everybody's going. So you're probably looking for a, you know, you're looking for something different. You're looking for a different approach, but what, like what else, like what, what helps you decide that you're going to invest in somebody's company? Uh, again, it's, it's definitely team. What is the problem they're trying to solve? How big, how far along is an MVP? Meaning just like, do, do they have something like a working prototype, a, you know, some, something interactive, do yeah. they have, Honestly, do they have beta customers? And what are the beta customers saying? I, I would put a lot more weight into hearing about beta customers A through D are raving and are willing to start write checks. You know, the question I've heard people ask sometimes is how upset would you be if like, you know, this company was just gone tomorrow? And if you get beta people that say, oh, we'd be totally screwed, like, whoa, there's something there. Even if it's a small sample size, you know, finding those raving fans early, I think, can be just so everyone wants to look at the impact that it would have on the company and everything else, but gosh, as a founder, just getting early adoption and people excited about your product is such a like strengthening kind of foundation for, for the hits and bruises that you get trying to grow a business because yes. it's not easy. And I think for the first time founder, the problem and why I would say try and get into one of these like tracks with like the launch group or like, you know, and there's a lot. So I'm just naming the two at the top of my head. Sure. Uh, YC is, you know, they're really good about trying to help you see those before you hit them. And when when I was around initially starting and kicking things around, I definitely made a lot of mistakes, you know, bad employment contract, uh, not putting together the right, uh, you know, go shares for equity, um, you know, drag along provisions, things that you you just think, hey, we're all on the same team. It's all going to go right until it doesn't. And then you're like, well, what what can I do? Oh, you can't do anything. You know, and so we've had some history with with selling a company where we had a shareholder that basically was trying to hold us hostage and refusing to sell their shares and was about to blow up the whole deal. And we were able to get it done. But, man, it was just like things you just didn't think would happen. And like I said, I feel like if you had gone through if you do go through a YC or a launch, you're going to see that stuff. There's a lot of boilerplate 
language and now in the contracting and, and the legal setup sure. that really helped kind of streamline the operations. But I highly recommend every founder reads every document they're doing because I'm telling you, there's so much in the in the detail of these docs. There's yeah. so much. Well, I mean, that's once again, I mean, it's just golden advice. So what I what I also hear you saying is you, you absolutely believe like there is there is absolute some value into these incubators, accelerators, like if you go to the right ones, I guess it's probably that's probably like an offline conversation, but making sure you go to the to the right places to get the right support. Yeah, I think you should be weary of anyone trying to get some sort of outsized um, equity stake for giving you advice. Okay. The, the best advice I've ever gotten is from people that don't need one single share. Don't ask for it, you know, like because they've there there's no um, you know principal agent issue where they're you know, of course they want to help you if they're going to get 10% of your company. And I've seen some crazy stuff with some of these like homegrown incubators that somebody that's failed three or four startups decides they want to start an incubator and advise startups. It's like, whoa, <laughs> you yeah. should have some, some success before you're advising people. I mean, I look at the sex success I've had and while I feel like I've done good, especially coming from my background, uh, there's no way I would give advice to, uh, you know, FinTech or, biotech or things that I have no expertise in, I would just be like, Hey, you need to find the right person. But there are people out there that will say, yeah, I can help you because they think it's all a marketing problem or it's all a scaling problem, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. And yeah. so I would just be weary of anyone trying to take, if the first conversation they're asking how much you're going to give them for advisory shares, you should run, you should just run. Well, that's good. And, and you, you kind of put another myth or another you know misconception out there down, which is, you definitely pay pay attention to the backgrounds of some of the people that you bring into your closer circle, and I and I like, and I've seen this both ways. Like, there's just in I mean, this is this is my opinion. You may not agree with this, but I I think you will. But like, there's definitely some value to having people that don't know that industry being like just just great, just overall business advisors to you and being a good help to you. But then, if you've got very specific business challenges and problems that they may be nuanced to that industry or to that specific, you know, there may be something to that where, okay, you, you don't really need a generalist. Now you really do need someone who's a lot more savvy on pharmaceuticals or biotech sure. or whatever. Right. Yeah. And to add a little bit more color to that, cause I, maybe I wasn't clear. I, I don't think I was, but I, a generalist is actually great. A well-connected generalist is even better. So somebody that may not have direct experience in everything you're doing is okay. But if they have the network of people that they can be like, oh, this is a legal problem. Let me call this person. Yeah, oh, this is right. like a formulation issue. Let me call this person. Like that's what you're hoping for from advisory. It's like, it's not always that they have the answers. It's that they know people that have the answers. Yeah. That, yeah, that's really awesome. And those people are gold. I mean, they, it's like they know everybody or they've, they've got this extensive network. And I mean, I, I, I love those people. I've got several of them in my network. I would love to be that guy eventually one day to just be connected to everybody. And if I can't solve your problem, darn it. I like, I know the guy you need or the lady that you need to help you crack this nut, you know? And so that's, totally. that's and the good cool. news is that you do have someone in marketing attribution. So <laughs> yeah. if yes. there's a problem, you know, you can send them my way and I'll help. Well done, sir. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> throw it in there. <laughs> That's great. Well, well, Ian, I, again, like super excited for you with funnel nine. In fact, I'm going to flash, uh, for those that can, that are watching this, you're going to see funnel nine.com tick along at the bottom of the screen. But if you are listening to this, jump on funnel nine.com so you can learn a lot more about the company. And apparently there's some website updates and things coming that yeah. we got a first look at. So we'll, we'll call it an, an, America's entrepreneur exclusive just for me. And so I, I appreciate that, man. No, but i um, really, really thrilled to, to be able to circle back and, and, uh, and to catch up with you just briefly to understand like what, what's going on, what's new. So, I mean, we covered, we covered just business growth. We covered pivot and just given your experience and expertise, I thought it was just, it was a perfect segue for those that want to learn more about like, man, like, you know, here Ian has had, you know, some starts and some successful exits and, and he invests. Wow. That's a really cool perspective. How do I then like go about tackling problems and forming my team and doing things in a way that could attract investment. And really, I mean, not to like 
simplify this all the way down to the bare bones. But like what I what I really hear you saying is like if you have something that works and people are excited about it and they don't want it to go away like that that's a clue you might want to pay attention to that you know so yeah yeah and that's that's ultimately what we're finding i mean you know funnel nine is just one story of many stories out there of where we started with our thesis that you know everyone needed marketing attribution and then we realized that they do but the people that really need it are the ones banging on the door. And so maybe we should just open that door. And I it, I know it sounds so obvious now, like when I say like, well, of course, e-com spends a lot on marketing. So of course they care. But it wasn't so obvious to us because we thought we were solving a problem that we, we knew we were solving a problem we had. So we just assumed that there was a lot more people like us. And what we found out is that there are, but not as many as, as there are Shopify e-commerce players who are spending 20, 30, 40,000 a month and going, I don't know what's working. Yeah. I mean, I've had calls with business owners as we were demoing that told me when iOS changed and cut off Facebook, that their business basically took a haircut to the point where they're thinking about BK because they literally didn't know what to do. All their Facebook ads just stopped performing oh my God. and they had no recourse. Like, what, what are they going to do? And why Apple did it and why Facebook did, did it, it's irrelevant. If you're not going to take and collect your own data, you're you're setting yourself up for this type of disappointment at some point in your career. So, you know, our, our take on this is collect it yourself, analyze it yourself. And that's where the insight guys, like that's what we yeah. do. Man, that's such a huge vulnerability too. When you are completely leveraged against whatever that platform is doing and having no control. And again, I'm just going to keep, I'm just going to keep banging the drum for funnel nine. Cause it's like, I think that's a great, that is a, that is a tremendous way to maintain control and to have pure insight into what you're doing and so that you can make you know your your marketing investing decisions as informed and as effective as you could possibly make them so 100 yeah well this has been fun man thanks so much for uh th care. thanks for jumping back on with me Ian. appreciate you man all right take care all right you too thanks for listening to america's entrepreneur if you enjoyed the show, please leave a review or comment on your preferred social media platform. Share it out with friends, family, coworkers, others in your network. And of course, you can write me directly at Aaron at boldmedia.us. That's A-A-R-O-N at boldmedia.us. Till next time.